Welcome to a Brass Check special. Uh, today we're going to be talking about an episode of American history that I don't think anybody has put all the pieces together on yet. And it spontaneously came to me today. I did some quick research and I think I may be on to something huge. Um, this happens to me from time to time. Uh, I read a lot. I analyze a lot. Uh, and we're not talking about a few books. We're talking about hundreds of books per year uh, and articles. And uh, this has been going on for decades. And you just accumulate a lot of information and suddenly uh, pieces fall together that might not fall together for somebody else that doesn't have as much information. Uh, also, I've been very active in a lot of uh, publicity type of operations. For instance, uh, there was a huge electrical, electrical, excuse me, electoral fraud in San Francisco in 1997. Uh, and I basically helped stop the funding and building of a uh, sports stadium. And very few people can say that in this country. Generally, when a sports stadium wants to go up, it goes up. And uh, we stopped it. And when I say we, I say me and two other people. And we were up against a uh, multi, multi-million dollar machine and all of the newspapers and all the TV stations. And uh, we prevailed. I also helped stop the building of the largest coal-fired cement plant in North America that was going to be put right on the banks of the Hudson River, right next to a little city, and it would have destroyed the city uh, and would have destroyed an agricultural region that's very important. So that started out as a group of about 15 people, and I was one of their chief advisors. And uh, seven years later, longer than World War II, we ended up stopping this Swiss company uh, whose claim to fame was they used slave labor all throughout Germany during World War II. Uh, I also helped uh, the person who revealed uh, what really happened in New Orleans after the uh, hurricane there. Uh, it wasn't the hurricane that destroyed New Orleans. It was the collapse of the levees and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which was responsible for those levees, went into overdrive as the tide was still rising to deflect blame from itself. They were, in fact, guilty. They spent uh, at least $10 million on publicity to cover themselves, and they controlled all the media as well. And uh, we prevailed, and that's basically three people total uh, with an organization, uh, in making sure that every news outlet in the U.S., including the crooked CNN and Fox and New York Times, states that it was the levies that caused the problem in New Orleans, not the storm. That was one of the great publicity undertakings of all time. And uh, so I've been involved in stuff like that. So I understand how publicity works. And something came up very interesting recently. Um, I was reading an article about the statues of Confederate generals that appear all, along, all over the South. And I remember the first time, I'm a Yankee, I'll admit it, and the first time I ever went to the South, I noticed this. It was like every single town uh, had a, a general, a Confederate general, uh, usually built with his back to the North. And frankly, I thought it was kind of funny. Um, but uh, anyway, it, it, it's now a, an, an area of contention, as well it should be. Because let's face it, if you're a black person living in the South, uh, do you really want to see the statue of the, uh, the general who was fighting to keep you a slave every time you go to the supermarket. I mean, that's not good. I, I can't see that that's good. Um, and what's interesting, and here's, here's, here's where this gets interesting. These statues were all built in a flurry of activity that started in the 1890s, uh, culminating, late 1890s, culminating in the 1920s. There was a burst and there was another burst uh, in, the, in the 60s. And you have to ask yourself this question, why? <clears throat> why, of all the times in, in the history of the South, was there a boom in Confederate general uh, statue building? Well, this is what I'm about to tell you now is, is nothing new, this particular piece of it. Uh, Maybe new to you, but it's it's pretty much pretty well known. Well, there was a there was a huge backlash uh, against black people in the in the teens and twenties in in uh, the South, and there were murders and lynchings and just you know all manner of horror. 
um, as the as certain elements of Southern society wanted to quote retake uh, their land, um, and at the very same time, and this was the, this was the height of the Ku Klux Klan, and at the height of that, that's when all those statues got built, and then things settled down. And then in, 19, in the 1960s, when black people in the South said, hey, we're American citizens, uh, we want to vote. That didn't go too well with the powers that be in certain places in the South. And so there was a lot of brutality again uh, against black people and up went another crop of statues. So the statues are clearly um, public relations devices. They're not genuine. They're not spontaneous. Uh, they're, they were built uh, in a coordinated effort by a group of people to make a point. Now, the other f kind of funny thing about these statues is 90% of them are absolute crap, and that really surprised the people that uh, so far have taken statues down in some of these towns. They're really very shoddily built. Poor materials, uh, they crumple very easily. They're cheap, they're, they're crap, they're garbage. Um, and we're gonna get to, to that uh, a little bit too. But if you're, if you're a thoughtful person, you're probably thinking, okay, I get it. Um, there were a bunch of statues built spontaneously all at one time. And, and who, who, literally who, what individuals made that happen? Because nothing on that scale happens in this world without somebody having a plan and somebody executing it. So the idea that it's spontaneous and it just happened is, we, is nonsense. I mean, look at the so-called alt-right. Um, does anybody remember there being an alt-right three years ago or two years ago even? I never heard of it. I mean, there, there was, but you know, it was minor, minor, minor leak stuff. Now it's front page all the time. Uh, do you think that's spontaneous? you think that just happened by accident? So whenever you see a big movement like Bitcoin, for example, um, or, or the alt-right or, or Confederate statues appearing everywhere, um, guaranteed it is not a spontaneous, uh, it's not spontaneous combustion. Uh, somebody had the idea, somebody wrote up a plan, somebody organized resources, which would be people and money, and then somebody supervised the work to make it happen. It, that's, how, that's the answer to everything that you see in this world. That is the answer to how it happens. So there's a lot of scholars, a lot of people pulling down full-time paychecks to do scholarship in this area, uh, the area of the, the Confederate uh, statues, journalists, full-time journalists. And I'm about to reveal to you something that you will not hear anywhere else in the world. And thank God for audio. Thank God for the Internet, because I don't have time to write this stuff down. I have, I got work to do. I got a lot of jobs I got to do just to keep the rent paid. Um, but anyway, here it is, something you will not hear anymore, anywhere else, and I think you'll find it enlightening. So, again, we've got these statues. They're propping up everywhere. Um, how did that happen? You might be surprised to learn that there was a strong connection in the South in the turn of the last century, the 1900s, between the Ku Klux Klan and the Anti-Saloon League. Have you ever heard that before? Well, now you've heard it. In fact, uh, one source says this. A local newspaper editor at the time wrote that, quote, in Alabama, it's hard to tell where the Anti-Saloon League ends and the Klan begins. Now, what was the Anti-Saloon League? Well, the Anti-Saloon League was a group, a spontaneous group, right? We know that's baloney. A spontaneous group that appeared out of nowhere that suddenly wanted to uh, outlaw alcohol consumption in the United States by human beings. Interestingly enough, the Anti-Saloon League has been credited with being the first modern pressure group organized around a single issue ever to appear in America. There was always debate. There were always pamphleteers. There were always people that wrote to the editor. You know, there was always people trying to move an agenda forward, but never before in the entire history of the United States and possibly the world 
was there ever a pressure group formed around a single issue? So this anti-saloon league, big deal historically. It's also a big deal that they were so closely affiliated with the Ku Klux Klan. That's, got, that's kind of wild, right? But you're going you're gonna to see what the connections are soon. In fact, let me tell you what the connections are right now. The Ku Klux Klan and the Anti-Saloon League and the American Red Cross were all represented in the South by Edward Young Clark and Mary Elizabeth Tyler, who created something called the Southern Publicity Association. Okay, so you got the Southern Publicity Association, and they were publicity agents and fundraisers for the Anti-Saloon League, the Ku Klux Klan, and the American Red Cross. Now, if you're a long-time Brass Check subscriber, you know that we've covered the Red Cross extensively. They are one of the shadiest operations on the universe. And if you get nothing else from this call, please get this. Never give the American Red Cross a nickel. They will waste it, they will squander it, and they will definitely not spend it the way that you think they're going to spend it. So when they're running their ads, every time there's a disaster, they run their ads, they collect millions and millions of dollars, none of the money gets to the people who need it, and the head of the Red Cross gets a $700,000 a year salary, and everybody else down the line gets similar, and the money just evaporates. So do not give money to the American Red Cross. But it's interesting that the American Red Cross and the Ku Klux Klan and the Anti-Saloon League all worked uh, all had the same representative in the South. Now, these two people, Clark and Tyler, were ambitious, and they were ruthless. And they had a certain amount of cunning, but they were not visionaries. They were not geniuses. They were not inspired. So when you see somebody running an operation, and they're not really all that, not, I don't want to say they're not bright, but, but they don't have a certain insight into the world. They may be good at executing, and hey, executing plans is, is the most important thing on earth, really. But when you see somebody that is a good executor, and let's, let's call them intelligent, but not visionary, you have to ask, where did the vision come from for this? And when we answer that question, we go deep, deep, deep down the rabbit hole. But before I reveal <laughs> who the visionary was behind this, uh, this agency, this Southern Publicity Association, who provided services to the Anti-Saloon League, the Ku Klux Klan, and the Red Cross, let me talk a little bit about their business model. Their business model as fundraisers was to raise money, obviously, and they, as the managers of the campaign, keep a percentage of the dollars. That's a common arrangement in fundraising. It goes on today. Sometimes if you're hit on by somebody trying to raise money for a big organization, um, you can almost bet for sure that that person on the other line or sending you the mail is actually getting a percentage of what you give. That's a very common arrangement. It's kind of a corrupt arrangement, but it's a pretty common arrangement. So they made money when they raised money. Make sense? So they were raising money for the Red Cross, and they were raising money for the Ku Klux Klan. Literally, they were fundraisers and organizers for the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, uh, Clark himself was an imperial grand wizard, and he's the guy who is really responsible for the explosive growth of the Ku Klux Klan in that period, in the 20s and around then. He created a membership society, and it was almost like a multi-level marketing. You'd become a member, and then you'd sign somebody else up, and that person would pay a membership fee, and you'd get part of it, and Clark would get part of it. It was, it was quite the scam, and it was, very, it was run extremely efficiently, and that is the time that the Klan became the biggest that it ever was and the most influential that it ever was. And at the same time, he was raising money for the Anti-Saloon League and the Red Cross. Now, the thing about fundraising is once you find a donor, create a donor list, you can always go back to it. So if, so if he raised money for the Red Cross, he could easily use that same list to raise money for the Ku Klux Klan uh, and for the Anti-Saloon League. 
or vice versa. You get how this works? So he and his, his girlfriend, by the way, that woman was his girlfriend. It was quite a scandal. They were both married, um, and they were not married to each other. Um, he and his girlfriend basically blanketed the South, um, hitting on villages, raising money, and, and pocketing, pocketing the money. All right. So where did, so let's 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 go. Um, oh, and by the way, they are probably the ones that sold these garbage statues. So they'd come into town and say, "Hey, let's um, let's do something good for our, our Confederate past. Let's build a statue to you know Jefferson Beauregard Sessions. I guess. Well, I'm sorry, that's our Attorney General, uh, but but somebody with a name like that. And uh, they they'd coordinate the raising of the money. They take their skim right off the top. They probably arranged conveniently for the st- to these garbage statues to be installed. They probably got a cut from that. So this was a profit center for that for this for this this group these people. It was a business. They were making money. That's why it was done in such an organized way. You know, if you're making money doing something and you've got a donor list of Red Cross donors and anti-saloon league donors uh, in the Deep South, it was pretty easy to hit those same people up for the, to the, for the, a statue in their town. And, of course, there's a social dynamic. Once one town has it, the other town has to get it. So do you see how this happened mechanically? Not spontaneous. Not spontaneous at all. Uh, but this goes much, much deeper. So hold on to your hats. So we've got two scam artists that are scouring the country, raising money for Confederate statues, probably working off their Red Cross donor list. And, uh, eh, okay, all right, so what? I mean, it's kind of interesting. It explains how it happened. explains the mechanics. We now can put a name to the people that did it. Um, We can see that... uh, the Ku Klux Klan was a very popular organization in the Deep South, and that there was a lot of crossover between Red Cross donors and, and Klan members, uh, and, and even temperance members, anti-Saloon League members. Okay, that's an interesting side note to history, interesting footnote. But wait, there's more. The very same time that these statues were going up all over the South was the beginning of modern corporate PR, public relations. And the two genius, and again, if you're a long time brass check subscriber, you know, the two geniuses who really invented corporate PR, i.e. corporate and government lying as we know it today, were Edward Bernays, who was a nephew of of, uh, Sigmund Freud, and Ivy Lee. And Edward Bernays did little tricks like he was hired by a tobacco company to convince American women to smoke. Now, up until that time, American women didn't smoke. It was they considered it a disgusting, filthy, masculine habit. You know, you don't see uh, women who want to be feminine walking around with lumberjack uh, shirts, right? Uh, well, they felt the same about cigarettes. It just wasn't ladylike. So women just flat out didn't smoke. Well, that's bad if you're selling tobacco and cigarettes. So they went to Bernays and they said, we got to get American women smoking. And he said, no problem. So what he did was in the New York Easter Parade, uh, which you can't imagine, this is pre-television, pre-internet obviously, pre-television, pre-radio, you know, pre-Hollywood extravaganza movies. You can't imagine how important parades were as an entertainment vehicle in that era. They were huge. Everybody had parades, brass bands, and they were a big deal. So when I say the Easter Parade in New York, I'm not talking about the Easter Parade that we know today. I don't even know if there is an Easter Parade, but uh, I'm not talking about the Easter Parade that we know of today. It's one of 10 million things that are going on every day. No, this was like a major, major event. All eyes were on it. So we hired a group of women. And there was all, at the time there was a strong suffragette movement going on. In other words, women couldn't vote, believe it or not. I mean, it's hard to imagine this, but that's a relatively recent phenomenon. And when this this uh, publicity thing occurred, women couldn't vote, and there was a group of women and men agitating, rightly so, for women to have the right to vote. And what he did was he hired this group, and he said, "Here's what I want you to do: when you guys get to St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is one of the 
places where all eyes were on at that time. I want you to stop, and I want you to all light up a cigarette. And those cigarettes are liberty torches. Think of them as liberty torches. It's showing the independence of the modern woman. And thereby, Edward Bernays linked the idea of being an independent modern woman with smoking cigarettes. And so if you've got an aunt or a mother or a grandmother or a sister that's got lung cancer, you can thank that son of a bitch because he's the one responsible. And you might say, no, that, it, that couldn't be. Things don't work that way. That's how things work. It's called The Crystallization of Public Opinion. He wrote an entire book on it. Uh, it was a popular book among the Nazis, the guy that handled all of the uh, publicity for the Nazis. Loved that book. He had many, multiple copies of it in his office. He gave them out to everybody. You ever heard of something called Kristallnacht? Crystal, everyone says, oh, well, Kristallnacht means they broke store windows. Crystal doesn't mean uh, window in German. It doesn't even mean glass. So where did that word Kristallnacht come from? The, the, that night where the Nazis went out and terrorized uh, Jewish store owners, was a crystallizing moment. It was planned, it was staged, it was meant to create a huge public impression and change the public mind rapidly. The crystallization of public opinion. And Bernays was an expert in it. It works. So anyway, that's Edward Bernays. And, and that's just one of the things he did. He's also the reason we have fluoride in our drinking water. Fluoride is a byproduct of aluminum manufacturing and, and other manufacturing processes. And it is a toxic substance. Uh, and it costs money to dispose of properly. Uh, with the help of some so-called medical doctors, they came up with the idea of putting trace amounts of it in drinking water and declaring that it was good for your teeth. Uh, recently, a bunch of doctors sued and said, hey, you want to put fluoride in water? Great. Put pharmaceutical grade fluoride in the water, and we're, and we're down with it. And uh, that didn't fly. No, what goes into the drinking supply all over the country, uh, where people are unfortunate enough to be drinking fluoridated water, is fluoride, fluoride from industrial processes. Edward Bernays is the man who made that scam work. Right, so when we're talking about the, the, the fathers of modern public relations, uh, we're talking about evil geniuses on a grand scale who had absolutely no morals of any kind. They would do anything to anybody as long as they got paid. So that's Edward Bernays. There was another guy equal in stature to Edward Bernays named Ivy Lee. Ivy Lee, very important name. He was the man that John D. Rockefeller Jr. hired to manage Standard Oil's publicity problems. And believe me, Standard Oil had a lot of publicity problems. And the Rockefellers were the richest people on earth. And they could afford the best, most ruthless guy on earth to handle their publicity problems. And they went to Ivy Lee to handle them for him, for them. Uh, you probably know about the Ludlow Massacre. We commemorate it every year on Brass Check TV. That's when uh, families uh, who were minding their own business <laughs> uh, in a tent encampment, uh, they were miners' families protesting bad working conditions, were gunned down. Men, women, and children slaughtered where they stood by a bunch of thugs paid for by the Rockefeller family. Um, Ivy Lee managed that. In fact, uh, in PR circles, it's considered the birth of crisis management. Um, so this is, a, this is one sick dude. Um, he also represented IG Farben, which was the, uh, the chemical company that, that ruled uh, Germans, Germany's economy. A lot of Germany's uh, economics came from the manufacture of chemicals and dyes, uh, and IB Farben was the giant, and he represented them in the United States. Uh, he is also reputed to have been the go-between between the Rockefeller family and the Nazi government in Germany, which only makes sense. I mean, he worked for the Rockefellers. <laughs> he worked for the biggest uh, uh, industrial concern in Nazi Germany. I don't think it's a stretch to think that he, he carried some messages between those two groups. Uh, so that's Ivy Lee, another not-so-good guy. All right. Remember I told you about 
Clark and Tyler and them running around the U.S. with this brilliant plan to put up statues everywhere in, uh, in the South? I think Ivy Lee and Clark and Tyler were working together. Here's some of my evidence. Lee was from Georgia. Ivy Lee was from Georgia, and that was Clark and Tyler's base. Ivy Lee's dad was a world-class racist. Uh, he wrote a lot of racist tomes, and he was a contributor to the classic Anglo-Saxon supremacy or race contributions to civilization, which appeared in 1915. So Lee uh, was a Southerner, and uh, he was a racist Southerner with a well-developed philosophy. Uh, now here's where the connection gets a little tighter. Lee was the publicity director, Ivy Lee was the publicity director, and later the assistant to the director of the Red Cross. He managed a campaign which way back in the early part of the 1900s raised $400 million for the Red Cross. That's one of the greatest, that, that is, he, can, he considered that and it's in his biography as one of his greatest accomplishments. I don't even know what $400 million in 19 teens money would be worth today, but I mean many, many, many billions. So he managed the fundraising campaign that Clark and Tyler executed on the ground in the South. So in fact, Clark and Tyler were agents for Ivy Lee's Red Cross fundraising efforts. So they knew each other. They came into contact with each other. I don't know anybody in all of scholarship who has connected Ivy Lee with Clark and Tyler. I just did. It's not that hard to make the connection. It's just a matter of plain historical fact. Now it gets even more interesting. I talked about the Anti-Saloon League and the fact the Anti-Saloon League and the Ku Klux Klan were both uh, clients of Clark and Tyler. All right, well, so what? Guess who was the number one financial supporter of the Anti-Saloon League? John D. Rockefeller Sr. Okay? So look at what we have here. We have Ivy League, Ivy Lee, who is a advisor of the most senior rank to the Rockefeller family. We have the Rockefellers supporting the Anti-Saloon League. And we have Clark and Tyler work, raising money for the Anti-Saloon League and for the Red Cross, which ties us back to Ivy Lee, right? Did John D. Rockefeller sit down with, with, with Clark and Tyler? And I, I doubt it. Did Ivy Lee uh, work in cahoots with, with, the, with the Rockefellers? Well, yeah, he was on their payroll. Was he a supervisor of Clark and Tyler in their fundraising efforts for the Red Cross? Yeah. And for the Anti-Saloon League, which was one of John D. Rockefeller's favorite charities. Interesting, huh? But it goes deeper. From 1906 to 1914, the Rockefellers were, this is from their own biography here. This is their own website, the Rockefeller Foundation website. They were, and I'm going to read, I'm just going to quote it. They were deeply involved in Southern society as creators of the General Education Board, that's GEB. Okay, and now here's the quote from their, from, their, from their website. The Rockefeller Foundation website, this comes straight from them. From 1906 to 1914, GEB field agents collaborated with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the USDA, to create over 100,000 demonstration farms promoting scientific agriculture across the South. So we've got the Rockefellers f founding the GEB, the General Education Board, running it from 1906 to 1914, and their goal was to uh, promote scientific agriculture across the South. And they were busy enough with the USDA to create over 100,000, I mean, think of that number, 100,000 demonstration farms. So what was going on? Well, what was going on was this. Agriculture in the South uh, was largely uh, an animal-driven uh, 
uh, deal, as it was in the whole country, uh, but it was particularly so in, in the South. And uh, the tractor had been invented, and tractors burn gasoline, and they need oil, and they need all kinds of things. But the South was moving very slowly. So to sp speed things up and to create a market for their products, um, Rockefellers, in their the generous way they are, uh, created this general education board, worked with directly with the U.S. government, the USDA, to train farmers in how to, you, you know, use tractors and modernize their, you know, use chemical-based, uh, petroleum-based uh, pesticides and petroleum-based fertilizer and just basically become vassals of uh, the, uh, the oil industry. Now, I've looked at pictures of classes held by this, this esteemed institution, and would you be surprised to know that I don't see any black faces in those classes? If you're a longtime subscriber to Brass Check, you know that there is a huge gap between the support that black farmers in the South and white farmers in the South get from the USDA. Uh, it's shockingly uh, extreme. Somehow, the uh, applications for aid, you know, everybody who farms at, on any scale gets all kinds of money from the government. That's just a fact. And the bigger your farm, the more money you get. And getting that government aid is what is, makes the difference between being able to survive and thrive and not doing too well. And somehow, black farmers' applications got lost, got misplaced, got turned down because they were missing something. And somehow white farmers found that it was very easy to get their paperwork pushed through. So you'd have them having an unfair advantage. Uh, black farmers would go out of business, and guess who'd be there to buy the land? That's, that's just how it is. So I really doubt that this, this joint Rockefeller program uh, with the USDA uh, did anything to help anybody but white farmers. And what was, again, what was the, the idea behind this program? To consolidate land holdings, to use more and more mechanized methods for agriculture. Uh, and that would create a market for gasoline, for diesel, uh, for oil, and for all the other uh, products, uh, pesticides, and chemical fertilizers that come out of the standard oil complex. So, Here's an interesting thing to think about. There was a huge uh, upswing of Ku Klux Klan activity. At the, we talked about those, those statues. And, I mean, there's always been harassment. There's always been mistreatment. There's always been terrorizing, brutalizing, brutalizing, all that kind of thing. But there was a sudden flare-up of it in the teens and the 1920s. This is when the statues went up. Uh, this is when... Uh, the, uh, the fundraising couple that I mentioned was, was so busy. Uh, this is when Ivy Lee was uh, working with them to raise a lot of money, going from town to town in the South, raising money. This is probably how the statues were built. But it also was the same time that the Ku Klux Klan was growing, and it, it happened to be the same people, Clark and Tyler, uh, who were the top fundraisers for the Ku Klux Klan. And in fact, in Tyler's case, the organizer uh, of the Ku Klux Klan. He was, he was the Grand Wizard. So lots of lynchings, uh, lots of murders, uh, countless uh, uh, beatings and, and muggings and just general program of terrorizing that, that just, just, just spiked in the 20s as these statues were going up. And as the Rockefellers were trying to get the South to consolidate its agriculture and mechanize it. All this stuff happened at the same time. Is it a coincidence? It's the same people working together using the same methods. And let's look at some, some numbers here. Um, in 1920, African American farmers made up approximately 14% of all farmers in the United States, roughly equal to what was then their percentage of the population. And they owned a combined 15 million, of acre, 15 million acres of farmland, primarily in the South. Where are we today? Um, 
black farmers own less than, far less than 1%. So we're talking about a radical and dramatic decline of uh, black farmers that started, coincidentally enough, at the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, at the sprouting of a thousand Confederate statues, and at the time of the Rockefellers doing this massive uh, education program for white farmers only. That was a period in history when a lot of black people just said, we've had it, and they moved to New York, they moved to Chicago, they moved to Detroit, they left town, and they left their farms. You can't bring your farm with you. Do you think that there's any possibility that when the Rockefellers were looking at their plan to centralize and mechanize southern agriculture, that they looked at the, the many, many hundreds of thousands of black families that were landholders in the South and said to themselves, you know what, we'd be better off putting this in hands that we like and understand. You see where I'm going with this? We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Ivy Lee advised uh, the people who raised the money to build the Confederate statues. There ain't no question about that. I'll bet my life on it that the connections are so clear. We know that Ivy League was a virulent racist. We know that the uh, Rockefeller family is as ruthless as it gets. Is it really a stretch to think that the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, which we already know was handled by this one public relations firm down in the South, which was connected to Ivy League, which was connected to the Rockefellers, is it really a stretch to think that that wasn't an accident? That there was a plan to drive black people off their farms, terrorize them, get them out, so that the land holdings could be consolidated, made bigger, and more ripe for mechanization. Now, that, that last part that I'm talking about right now is speculative. But it's just amazing how all the players uh, all were in the same place at the same time while all this stuff just happened to be happening. And it all worked out to the benefit of what was then a phenomenally expensive program that the Rockefellers were engaged in to change the face of Southern agriculture. And the, changing the face of Southern agriculture meant getting black people off their land. That's, that's just a fact. So that needs more research. And maybe there's somebody out there uh, who can take what I've put forward and find the details, if, if in fact I'm correct in my, in my guess that that's what happened. But what we don't have to guess about is the fact that all those Confederate statues came as a result of a south, south-wide fundraising program that was run by two people who had direct connections to Ivy Lee, and Ivy Lee was the you know, the chief public relations advisor to the Rockefeller family. That connection is indisputable, can't be questioned, can't be doubted. It's absolutely there. It's absolutely correct. So when you're going, when you hear this story about, oh, you know, we've got to maintain our heritage and it's not fair to take down these statues. Remember, these statues were built long after the Civil War. Uh, they were not built spontaneously. They were built as a money-making opportunity by two crooked people. Uh, and it's very possible, too crooked and profoundly racist people, because one of them was the uh, Grand Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, I, it, isn't it amazing that none of this gets into the news? You know, I'm just a guy working three jobs, doing a million things, and I can, I can find this stuff in my spare time. And I bet you've never heard about this. I bet you could research all day and night. You'd never see anybody put these connections together. But basically, those statues are the results of a, of a deeply racist man, uh, individual couple, um, who turned creating misery in the South uh, into a money-making opportunity for themselves, almost certainly with the inspiration and guidance of Ivy Lee, and quite possibly in the service of the Rockefellers who wanted to see land holdings in the South consolidated and hyper-mechanized so they could sell more of their products to the South. So that's Brass Check. 
Uh, that's our uh, spontaneous. That this is spontaneous, unlike the other things that happened. This is was our spontaneous realization today. As I was putting a few different pieces together, uh, I'd love to write it down, but there's no time. But at least it's on tape. You've heard it. Maybe you could share it with people you think might be interested in it, and maybe somebody. Uh, who's looking for an interesting project to do uh, can take these threads and uh, and tie them up tightly because I think there's something there. It's very sinister, uh, it's very dark, but um, the coincidences are too too many uh, for them to just be uh, sheer coincidences. You know, there's there's that old saying, you know, once is a uh, a happenstance, twice is a coincidence, three times is enemy action. And uh, I detect enemy action in uh, these reports.